Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. And welcome to our event on recent equity market volatility and on growth investing, especially. And we know everything that's gone on in the markets over the past you know, couple months, if not a little bit longer. We've got an exciting discussion planned for today. We're going to dive into those issues in greater detail, as well as discuss how certain processes can help you know the right time to make a move from maybe the right time to sit still. And my name is Gerald Guger, Head of Content Strategy at Manny and Napier, and I'll be leading today's discussion. And I am joined here today by two individual analysts from our investment research team. They each spend their days digging through specific companies, following sectors, industries, themes, each and every day. And those are Jake Boak, Senior Analyst within our technology team, who joined us actually on a webinar just a few months back. Happy to have you back, Jake. Jake comes from Hobart College with a degree in economics and has been with us for nearly 15 years, also has prior experience on capital goods and materials and over 10 years covering technology. So again, Jake, welcome. Thanks for having me. And I'm also joined here today by John Biter, an analyst within our technology team. John joined us from SUNY Geneseo with a degree in economics and has been covering semiconductors media, the cable companies and telcos, and more for over 10 years now. So I think, John, it, it's going to be great having you here today as well. All right. Thanks for having me. And for those who are joining us for the first time, Manning Napier is an investment manager headquartered in Rochester, New York, with over $20 billion in portfolios ranging from stocks, bonds, multi-asset class strategies as well. We've been managing traditional fundamentally driven bottom-up portfolios for over 50 years, supported by a disciplined process of three stock selection strategies amongst a majority of those. And those are our strategic profile, which is kind of a Garpy strategy. We'll talk about that a lot today. This is why I'm introducing these concepts now. As, as we dive into these portfolios, you'll hear some of these things come up. And then we also have a hurdle rate strategy for cyclical names, perhaps less common, but still relevant, certainly in bankable deal as well. And so again, we'll spend most of the discussion talking about what's happened with growth investing, but that strategic profile uh, will certainly be a key topic of conversation as well. So with that, let's get into the agenda. And our agenda today is gonna be a bit more free flowing. We are going to briefly provide a little bit of market context and how we got to where we are today. And then we're gonna have a conversation, a round table discussion, and we encourage you all to submit questions throughout the proceedings. We'll also have a few polls sprinkled in as well. We're curious to hear what all of you have to say on a couple of interesting topics. And then lastly, we're going to leave a, a good deal of time open at the end for dedicated question and answer. So with that, let's get into it. And just again, a little bit of market context, as you can see here up on the screen, uh, growth versus value has been a key topic of conversation and especially year to date, but even more broadly than that. Growth had had a tough run towards the end of last year. And although the market hit a peak, maybe the first or second trading day of January, it's been kind of a continued challenge up through the end of last week, which is where we have the data shown here. I will say that while geopolitical concerns have certainly taken the forefront of late, the issues causing some of this, as well as um, its broader impact on the equity market itself, is still very much fundamental to what's going on in financial markets now. And so when I say that, what I'm really getting at is talking about interest rates and inflation, which are certainly a topic we hear from all of you. We know that that's keeping many of you up late at night um, and it, it remains a key concern. So before I hand it over to John to ask John what keeps you up late at night, I wanna open it up first for a poll. We actually wanna know what all of our listeners here today think. We know we have a lot of financial advisors on the call, talking to a lot of clients. We'd like to know what is your say number one concern, it is multiple choice. If you have multiple concerns keeping you up late at night, that could be a health concern, but feel free to flag uh, more than one answer if you have them. So John, with that, while we wait for the results to come in, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so you, you listed a bunch of factors on that poll. And I, I guess I don't worry about what those factors mean for market sentiment in and of themselves. Uh, I, I think it's certainly true that those factors, particularly, like you mentioned, inter interest rates and concerns about inflation, are driving negative sentiment and they're compressing valuations pretty indiscriminately year to date. But I think the evidence that they're a death knell for tech stocks or for growth stocks more broadly 
is pretty poor, uh, at least over any extended time period. Yep. Putting that argument aside for the moment, uh, ultimately Jake and I are fundamental analysts and we think strong fundamentals win out long-term kind of regardless of what style box is in vogue at the moment. So with that in mind, certainly inflation and interest rates can have downstream effects on company fundamentals, but our processes, which you mentioned briefly above, uh, they remain consistent through all market environments and they naturally screen for companies that are less exposed to those sorts of macro factors. So you mentioned the profile strategy, which is where we capture most of our growth exposure. One of the key aspects of the growth of the profile strategy is pricing power, which is to say that during periods such as now where companies input costs are rising, we're looking for companies that are able to pass those costs through to their customers and maintain or even expand their margins. You know, regarding interest rates, we're looking for companies with strong balance sheets and strong cash flows that are uh, less reliant on capital markets to fund their, their operations. We're looking for companies with durable secular growth prospects through different macro environments. Uh, so I guess to, to actually answer your question, I cover semis, which is one of the more cyclical areas within tech. And I worry in the near term that, you know, after a period of pretty intense supply constraints that the market kind of overcorrects, we add too much capacity too soon and we enter into an, a period of oversupply. But even, you know, that overarching worry, I'm drilling down to the specifics of the individual companies that I cover, not all of whom are going to you know, suffer from that the same way. Jake, you want to jump in and give us your take on what's keeping you up late at night? Yeah, sure. Um, I sleep pretty well. Um, and I guess I'm not saying that I'm, I'm not concerned with some of these things that John points out. Uh, I'm certainly hopeful that the Fed doesn't make a policy mistake. Um, I'm keeping an eye on rising energy prices and sort of how that impacts the consumer balance sheet. Uh, but I'm less concerned um, about many of the issues that are sort of front page news. And I'm more concerned about what's coming down the pike that we don't know about today. Um, so that's what worries me the most. Um, if you force me to give you something, I'd say that uh, I suppose one area that comes to mind for me is sort of increased regulatory scrutiny of some of these large digital platforms. Um, what's evident to me is that you know regulators are um, trying to figure out the best lens in which to view these types of businesses. Uh, we've seen China be a bit more heavy handed than other countries with their digital platforms. Um, but I would expect that sort of the Amazons, Googles, Facebooks of the world will sort of continue to remain under the microscope for years to come. Um, and to the extent regulators sort of uh, move their antitrust framework away from consumer harm, some of these businesses might, uh, might alter their business practices uh, in the years to come. Um, ultimately, that's going to play out over many years. So it's not really an acute concern, but it's something that we're keeping an eye on uh, and worth monitoring. Jake, let me follow up and ask a little bit more specifically. So in general, it seems like you're very calm um, with your approach with everything that's happened to the markets right now. How do you cope with these bouts of volatility, like what we've seen over the past six, eight, 12 weeks? Uh, great question. I, I think that volatility gets a bad rap personally. Um, the term sort of has this odious stench incorrectly associated with it. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily like inherently bad. Um, I think it was Benjamin Grant who said that, you know, in the short run, the, the stock market is a, is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. Um, and that really resonates with me. Uh, how a stock performs on sort of any given day and the magnitude of that performance um, says almost nothing about the value of the underlying assets. It's really just a, a I guess, a result of the collective buying and selling going on that day. Um, I will say that sort of in periods of heightened volatility, um, I'm looking for ways that I can exploit that. So it might be an opportunity for me to buy more of an existing holding um, that's sort of getting thrown out the bathwater. Uh, or maybe I've been on the sidelines for a long time waiting for a particular company to become cheap enough and price out. Um, and now I finally get to initiate a position. So for me, I try to focus on sort of what I can control um, and volatility just isn't one of those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Controlling. Oh, John, jump in, please. I was just going to add on top of that. I, I think a big thing is you have to be comfortable with your portfolio and with the risk that you're taking in your portfolio. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I'm not too worried about what a stock does on a particular day, but if you're looking at your portfolio and you think in a reasonable bear case scenario, you could see your portfolio decline pretty substantially, then maybe you're not comfortable with 
uh, you know, a changing market environment. Uh, so a lot of it has to do with you know, evaluating your own risk and, and whether you're comfortable with, with the risk that you're taking at that moment. John, I want to go right back to you as well. You had made a comment previously in your original answer about death knell and talking just there in your answer as well about the changing market environment. Can you speak a little bit to how inflation and interest rates and some of the work that you've done to try to understand why it may not be such a death knell for growth style names? Yeah, I guess, you know, neither Jake or I are trying to be glib when we say, you know, we sleep well or, you know, we're not concerned about interest rates or inflation. It's just that if you look at previous cycles where interest rates have risen, the idea that they've had any lasting negative effect on growth relative performance, the evidence is pretty mixed. Uh, so we looked at the four periods where rates have risen uh, since 1990, so over the past 32 years, and we took a look at both growth style and tech sector performance over each of those periods, looking at the data both in terms of how those equities performed over the entire raising rate environment, which was different in each case, and also how they performed over a set time period ranging from three months to three years. Uh, and what you see is each rate rising rate environment was really individualized. And it, it would be kind of a mistake to simplify your analysis to just these broad kind of market regime changes. You know, most notably, one of these four rising rate environments was actually during the inflation of the tech bubble, where despite rising rates, valuations actually expanded to uh, obviously irrational levels. So that kind of flies in the face of the kind of conventional wisdom about what happens when interest rates rise. So more broadly, the point is that each market environment is different. And more importantly, equity markets are not monoliths. Different companies within these broad categories of tech or growth are going to face different amounts of fundamental pain and sentiment shock. You know, inflation, depending on how long it lasts, is going to compress some companies' margins. It won't compress other companies' margins. Depending on the length and amplitude of this rate height cycle, some companies may not be able to invest as much because the cost of capital gets too high or they may see reduced demand because their customers' cost of capital gets too high. Others are going to have more durable demand. So we tend to view environments like this where the difference between higher quality growth and lower quality growth becomes more stark and becomes more evident. And it's an opportunity for us to kind of take advantage of some uh, you know, compelling opportunities. John, let me pull on that a little bit further. So lower quality growth, higher quality growth, you mentioned 2000, certainly a period where there was a lot of poor quality growth that happened. How do you determine what you would consider quality? Yeah, so we've referenced the, the profile strategy a couple of times. That's at a high level, it's, it's sort of what you might describe as the highest quality companies. It's companies that have pricing power, have high switching costs for their products, they're taking share in large and secularly growing markets that have high barriers to entry. But if you take a, a more basic cut at, the easiest way to differentiate quality versus non-quality is, does the company make money consistently? So we actually took a look at this. We looked at the Russell 3000 growth index, which is about 1,700 companies that Russell determined had relatively higher sales and earnings growth and relatively higher valuations than the overall Russell index. And we divide that growth index into companies who have generated positive free cash flow over consistently over the last three years and those who haven't. And you can see over the last year, the profitable growth, profitable growth names have consistently outperformed uh, the unprofitable growth names and the market as a whole. And as the market sentiment started to shift in late 2021, that disparity became even starker. Jake, I want to send this over to you because, and maybe I'm mistaken, I'm still kind of under the view that, that tech or growth in general is expensive. I can see the sharp downturn in unprofitable growth. You know, how do you stay disciplined with such a, you know, expensive market to pick in? I might push back a little bit on, on whether tech is expensive. Um, I think there are maybe pockets of tech that have looked expensive up until recently. Um, particularly in a relative sense. But some of that speculative excess, I would argue, has been sort of confined to stocks that are, you know, hyper growth. Um, I wouldn't say unprofitable, but poor earnings quality, has a lot of price momentum. Um, I would say that, and John, step in here if you, if you disagree with me, but we're not having a hard time finding new ideas. Uh, we're not having to stretch to a bull case model uh, for many of our existing holdings, which is typically what happens when things start to get pricey. Um, 
I think what you're really asking is sort of how do we invest in growth without paying through the nose um, and exposing clients to the risk of significant investment losses if and when the multiple contracts, right? And I suppose my answer would be that every good investment process hinges on a playbook and sort of a set of pricing disciplines, uh, whether you're a growth investor or a deep value investor. Um, and not to sound glib, but I think the whole value versus growth dichotomy, uh, I just don't believe the style boxes are sort of as diametrically opposed as maybe Morningstar would have you believe. Um, I think the lines can get really blurry. Uh, in my experience, you know, growth can absolutely be value. Um, you know, if I buy a company, Salesforce at six times sales, and it compounds out 20% returns in the next five years, um, I don't understand why that wouldn't be considered value, right? But according to some, you know, Morningstar boxes, that would be a growth name. Um, but to your question, how do we stay disciplined? Um, again, I think you need to have a process uh, and a playbook so you aren't just shooting from the hip and buying anything that grows fast. All right, well, then I got to ask you, can you talk more about the playbook? What, you know, how much color, maybe you can't give me too much color on exactly what all the plays are that are in the playbook, can you, but can you give us a little bit of insight into what that is? Yeah, yeah, so definitely. I think the importance of having a playbook, it, it can't be understated, right? Um, you don't buy growth for the sake of buying growth. That's kind of how you get blown up. Um, if you're just buying sort of the 30th fastest names in a market in the market or the index, you know, that's just crazy. So, you know, you don't want to buy Zoom in 2020 at 100 times sales when, when the revenue is growing 300, 400 percent. You know, same thing with Peloton, right? You saw demand pulled forward during the lockdowns. The top line goes gangbusters. The stock went from five times sales, I think, to 20. And I think today it's probably back down to two times sales. So you have to have a playbook, uh, which to me is more like an accumulation of knowledge and uh, maybe the application of sort of different tools and exercises, which help you avoid those blowups and then helps you double or triple down in your winners. Um, in our playbook, you know, I can't go into specifics, but it very much focuses on sort of monitoring the strategy fit, um, understanding rates of change, combating biases, uh, and constantly sort of evaluating position size in context of other holdings. I'd say that probably the most robust part of our process um, is to really evaluate how things sort of play out relative to our expectations. And we do this for every single company, um, both companies that we own and even companies that we don't own, uh, maybe companies that we've tracked, you know, quarter after quarter, year after year, but never ended up buying for one reason or another. And what we've seen is that, is that those that do well relative to our expectations, um, we sort of identify what that was the case. And then those that sort of uh, fall short of expectations, we also... Uh, can identify why that was the case. Um, and it allows us to kind of create this lens uh, in which you can use when working on new investment ideas and basically allows you to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff pretty quickly. If you find a name that does fit the bill, it's not, you know, chaff, it's wheat, I suppose, using the analogy correctly, I, I think. How do you determine, and maybe you already covered this a little bit, but how do you determine the right time to buy or the right time to sell? I know that that is kind of a key question right now, especially with a lot of these names having sold off quite a bit. Yeah, so I, I guess I'll take that. Uh, so frankly, we don't really try and market time. It's kind of a fool's errand to think that you can consistently buy a stock at its lowest point uh, when, when price is declining and sell it at the highest point uh, during its increase cycle. We're trying to identify strategy fits with a particular eye for strategy fits that are improving. And then we apply our valuation disciplines to assess whether the stock is trading below our estimate of fair value. And pretty simply, if it's trading sufficiently below our estimate such that we have uh, what's called a margin of safety, we'll buy the stock. Uh, the size of that position that we recommend tends to be dictated by kind of our view of the risk versus the reward. That is, how far is the stock currently from our estimate of fair value? And conversely, how far is it from our estimate of how low it could fall if things go wrong? If we're wrong about our thesis, if the company gets disrupted, if you know, if things go wrong broadly, um, on the sell side of the environment, you know, when you're trying to exit a position, that tends to be much more weighted towards our view of the fundamental environment. So we don't want to hold stocks at irrational valuations, obviously, but we also recognize that our valuation estimates are kind of lagging indicators of our fundamental view of the company. If a company is no longer tracking our thesis, and as such, it's no longer going to track our estimates long-term, we need to uh, recognize that our valuation is probably outdated and we should probably exit the stock. 
I, I would just maybe simplify it from, from my perspective and say that on the buy side, you know, assume that the stock meets the required strategy fit criteria and it prices out, um, I would argue that you buy it, right? Um, now, the caveat being that you need to take all available information into consideration when you're thinking about appropriate position size. Uh, I would say it's it's rarely, rarely the case at Manning and Napier when an analyst pounds a table on a new idea and says, I want max position size right off the bat. It's far more common to kind of ask for a start position and kind of dip a toe, if you will. Um, and as John said, you know, we're not market timers. That's just sort of not our game. Um, what I like to do is think about max on position size and sort of work backwards. So if I have a, you know, a, a, a lot tight, a great strategy, fit, great profile company, um, great balance sheet, and I know there's 50% downside in sort of like a recession scenario, right? Um, I'll just tranche it out. You know, I might ask for 1% up front and I might ask for, you know, another 100 bips, 20% lower, you know, another, another 100 bips, 20% lower um, until I get to the point where like I'm all in because the price is just so cheap. Um, that's sort of the process that I kind of use. Um, and in doing so by having sort of like a predetermined game plan, if you will, it really reduces the amount of stress that I feel when the market goes against me right? Because I know that I've left myself ample dry powder. Um, and rather than focusing on being down or 10 or 15% on my initial investment, I'm almost giddy at the fact that I get to buy more such a compelling valuation. Just to- Jake, I love that. Oh, sorry, John, go ahead. I was just going to peg onto that. There's also times where things play out better than we expect. And we're also going to be willing to buy a larger position, potentially a higher price, if our view of the fair value of a stock has also increased commensurately. You know, I was going to just say, Jake, I love that concept that, hey, sometimes it's worth inverting the thinking a little bit and not thinking so much in terms of a smaller position. But, hey, what would your max position be in tranching from there? Uh, you know, an, an interesting concept that could have value. I know we have a lot of advisors on here who, well, maybe some of them have individual equity names, but a lot of them are, you know, are looking to investment managers to help them with that, regardless of how they're handling it, though. Those types of, you know, insights, thinking differently, uh, changing your approach or your perspective, those combat behavioral biases and these types of things that can really hamper portfolio performance or cause less clear decision making. So we did want to highlight that specifically and ask all of our listeners via a poll if they have any processes in place today to help combat some of the more common ones. And we've listed just four of them. It, it should show up with Zoom here any second now. Um, <clears throat> and you can you can select multiple if you have those in place as well. But with that, Jake, I want to send it over to you. Can you talk a little bit more about how the playbook and the processes can help fight some of these things? Yeah, um, I would say that our investment process is sort of designed to save ourselves from ourselves. Um, we're very much sort of aware of all the biases and pitfalls that it can sort of impact decision making. And we've tried to create tools uh, or adopt practices to kind of minimize those biases. So, I mean, for example, like confirmation bias, right? It's a big one for investors. It's, it's the person who only reads kind of what confirms their thesis. Um, so they only talk to the company CEO, who's obviously gonna paint his or her company in the best light, uh, or they only read sort of the most bullish sell side to analyst reports on a particular company, basically just ingesting what confirms or supports your view, right? And our process has been to try to combat that by talking to competitors. Um, we'll talk to disgruntled former employees um, we find out who the most bearish analyst is in the street and we'll spend time talking to them. Um, we'll find out who is short the stock and we'll set up a call with them and try to understand their angle. Um, because for me, if I understand the bear case and sort of feel good about my ability to refute that, um, my hit rate is going to be much higher on my investments. Um, so that's sort of the process that we use um, for that bias. Um, anchoring bias, I think, is another one that comes to mind which is just sort of the tendency to, for an investor to sort of underweight new information, uh, not being flexible, right? Just being overly rigid. Um, an easy example there, uh, you know, as a general rule of thumb myself, I don't really look at price charts. Um, I might every now and then just to kind of get a pulse in the market, but I sort of try to avoid knowing anything about the stock price for a new company I'm working on. Um, and I'll build out an entire model and make all my assumptions and sort of come up with my own kind of uh, estimate of what fair value is without ever knowing the share price. And the reason I do that is because um, if I know that company X is currently trading at like 50 bucks, um, that information may impact my assumptions, right? If my model is spitting out $500 fair value, I'm going to say to myself, you know, whoa, 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 let's pump the brakes on my assumptions here. 
Um, I don't need to be that aggressive and I'll probably dial it back. But maybe it truly is a 10 bagger and I'm simply just guilty of sort of anchoring to the current stock price. Um, so those are sort of a few of the practices and tools uh, that we use to try to combat some uh, common investment, investment biases. Yeah, I, I think just as important as, as the work we do individually to combat these biases is, you know, we work together as a team to try and uh, identify the biases that, you know, other members of the team may be exemplifying. So Jake and I have worked together for nine years as have we worked with the other two analysts in the group for about the same time. So we were developed a pretty highly collaborative approach over time where we're constantly challenging each other's assertions to make sure that, you know, just because Jake has looked at a company for a couple months or, you know, potentially owned it for years that he's not falling victim to, you know, he's worked so hard on, he feels, you know, some sort of attachment to it. Maybe he's exhibiting anchoring bias because his model, he worked really hard on it and is loathe to kind of change his estimates. Whereas I may come in with a fresh set of eyes and point out some things that maybe he hasn't seen yet and obviously vice versa. I wanna change gears just a little bit as we move through the discussion. And I wanna make sure we leave ample time for this. And it sounds like both of you do have certain areas where you are particularly optimistic still about where you like the investment prospects. So I wanna ask each of you, to take a moment and turn, Jake, maybe we'll start with you. Can you talk about some areas or some themes where you're seeing uh, you know, an attractive backdrop right now? And while we do so, I'll uh, make sure that we put up our takeaways as well. Jake? Yeah, um, I think e-commerce comes to mind for me. Um, you know, COVID and all these social lockdowns, in my view, were basically a, a forcing mechanism. Um, many consumers you know, turned to eBay um, for everyday necessities like toilet paper and other essentials. Uh, many people spent more of their leisure time behind their smartphone, adding things to their Amazon carts. Um, and so what we saw in 2020 was just massive growth in e-commerce. Um, but as the economies have reopened, you know, consumers have kind of shifted their purchase habits uh, away from things and back to experiences. Um, and then also in-store shopping as well. So e-commerce really plummeted uh, in the back half of 21. Um, and that was really evident in the data that we saw, you know, in the second half of last year, we actually saw U.S. retail sales uh, grow faster than e-commerce, which has never happened, like ever happened. Um, but we think that reverts as we move throughout 22. Um, and basically our working thesis, thesis is that COVID pulled forward customer acquisition by a few years for many of these online marketplaces, which is a pretty big deal, um, particularly in places like Latin America and Southeast Asia, where online penetration is much lower um, so I think we'll probably look back in five years and it'll be very clear that COVID was sort of a catalyst uh, in many developing regions for consumers making online purchases. Um, so that's one. I think the other one that I would point to um, is just cloud computing, right? Um, major theme. Um, the growth we're seeing there is just incredible. Um, you know, AWS, I think, is roughly at like a $70 billion run rate today, and it's still growing, you know, north of 40% year over year. So that's, that's a major theme and the growth we're seeing there is like just hard to even wrap my head around. Jake, if I could jump in for a second. So if it's that major of a theme, can you take a minute and explain exactly why that's such a significant theme, maybe exactly what cloud computing is? And I know that that's been a topic for a number of years. So maybe a little bit on why you're still seeing so much runway for growth. Yeah, so when I say cloud computing, uh, I'm really referring to like the hyperscale vendors. Um, which basically, you know, rent, compute, storage, and kind of bandwidth capabilities. Um, so let me just back up. Like in a, in a traditional like on-premise environment, right? A company's IT organization goes out and buys servers. They put them in their data center. Um, they'll run platform software on top of that, you know, databases, cybersecurity software, and then a bunch of sort of application software um, on top of that. And obviously they have like sort of like an IT organization that manages all that for the enterprise. Um, software as a service basically said, hey, we'll deliver you the application, everything underneath it. So the end user just basically logs into the application, right? Maybe it's a workday, maybe it's Salesforce, but they log into it just as they would like using like a Gmail account basically. Um, and delivering software in sort of that manner obviates the need for all the associated infrastructure underneath it. Uh, and then the IT staff to manage that infrastructure. And so the cloud providers, and I'm talking about like AWS, Amazon, um, Azure, which is Microsoft and GCP, Google Cloud Platform uh, in the US, 
they either own or lease data centers um, and all the equipment with that. So the servers, the storages, the storage and the racks. Um, and then they effectively rent all that infrastructure to consumers or customers, excuse me, um, on a pay-as-you-go basis. So they provide sort of infinite scale on demand and you only pay for what you use. And I guess it's not that dissimilar from like a utility, right? And why this area is so exciting is because businesses of all sizes uh, and all industries are undergoing a pretty massive digital transformation right now, um, sort of going from you know paper to spreadsheets to smart applications, uh, creating new business processes and customer experiences. So um, all this obviously started before COVID, but the trend has really significantly accelerated as workforces kind of went remote. So our view, again, we think that COVID will uh, show that it was an inflection point with cloud computing and the hyperscalers are in a pretty favorable position to um, uh, uh, I guess benefit from that trend. John, I don't know if you have something quite as grandiose, but I'll turn it over to you if you could give us something where you see a particular opportunity today. Yeah, I mean, everything that Jake just talked about uh, requires a boatload of semis uh, in you know, very technical terms. Uh, we need more electronics, we need more compute power at a time when semiconductors are getting more difficult to manufacture due to technological changes, challenges, you know, the slowing of Moore's law, basically. This is going to be hugely positive for unit demand as well as pricing, uh, which means I think the long-term growth rate of semiconductors is actually set to accelerate. Um, similarly, it's going to be, you know, we need more of them, so we need more equipment to buy them. So I think the semi-cap equipment guys are also going to stand to benefit. And you know, separately from cloud computing and, and e-commerce that Jake mentioned, things like electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles are starting to ramp, which have their own investment opportunities, but are also positive for semi-demand. All right, before we get to the q and I wanna ask each of you one more time, if we could flip the script a little bit, I think we're doing a lot of that reverse thinking today. And if you could give us each an area that you think is perhaps a little bit overblown right now from perhaps a marketing or mind share perspective. Jake, you wanna go first? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think Bitcoin is getting a lot of attention, um, too much attention personally. Um, I'm not suggesting we're sort of in a crypto bubble, but I think crypto is sort of only one use case um, and I think far more attention should be paid to sort of the underlying blockchain technology, um, which I think has the potential to be, you know, highly disruptive for many industries. So to me, it's, you know, I, don't, I think Bitcoin gets way too much attention. Do you, Jake, you mentioned the blockchain, uh, the blockchain. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that right now and maybe give us some use cases for that? Yep. So, um, the best way to explain blockchain, I think, is to think about it like a, maybe like an obsessive club filled with members who love to kind of keep track of everything. Um, and there's a ton of rules, but each member sort of records what happens. And once that data is recorded, uh, it's verified by all the members and it basically is accepted as gospel, right? It can't be changed. Um, and then new information is sort of added on top of that and that continues forever. Uh, and then if someone new joins the club, they can go back and check all the records and they can see that, you know, John ate a cookie at 10 a.m. yesterday or a red squirrel, whatever, cleaned up my bird feeder last night. And so the basic idea is that blockchain allows for sort of decentralization. Uh, you don't need CNN or a government to basically uh, tell you about that cookie that John had before lunch because the network already confirmed it. Um, and I think if you think about sort of most of the major services around the world, they're all dominated by centralized entities, right? Mega cap corporations or the government. Um, and I think most do a reasonably good job of providing these services, but there are definitely drawbacks of centralization. Um, and blockchain is a way to sort of combat some of these drawbacks, like lack of transparency or the data being prone to manipulation or censorship, or even just being a single point of failure. Um, so that's sort of the, 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 you know, the quick and dirty on blockchain. So if I could summarize, cryptocurrency is a little bit less enthusiastic, but blockchain perhaps more so. I think that's fair to say. All right, John, do you want to take a second and uh, badmouth something for us? Yeah, for, first I'd, I'd like to defend my honor and say that I waited until after lunch to have a cookie yesterday. <laughs> um, but in, in terms of what I'm looking at, uh, you know, there's been a big push by the telcos to push 
5G for the home or fixed wireless access as a replacement for traditional cable or fiber broadband. Uh, you know, essentially the cellular network that you use your smartphone on, you would use your PC and, and other home devices on. And, you know, the telcos are counting as the next great growth driver for them. They obviously need to justify their investment in all this 5G capacity. But if you kind of look at what they have to do, the technical challenges just seem pretty insurmountable. So, you know, one, uh, you generate a lot more data traffic on your home PC than you do on your smartphone, like orders of magnitude larger. So the challenge just from a technical point of view is a lot harder to replace home broadband uh, with this uh, network that's designed for much less usage. Uh, the other thing is 5G technology is still sort of unproven about how reliable it is. Uh, you know, there's different approaches to 5G. Some are more reliable than others, but have lower uh, aggregate performance, and some are still kind of questionable whether you can actually roll them out. You say unreliable, just curiosity here. I know I've seen stories before that 5G is so unreliable that sometimes trees and the wind can cause it problems. I guess I'll ask, is that true? Yeah, so there, there's sort of two main flavors to 5G. There's high band 5G, which is very high performance, but you need line of sight from your uh, access point to the actual tower. So in a city, if you're in a smaller building and there's a skyscraper next to you, you can lose your, your signal, essentially. Um, the other flavor is called mid-band 5G, let's say. Uh, that is more reliable. There's less of these uh, line of sight issues, but the uh, speed upgrade is relatively minor relative to 4G. So it's not all that exciting of a technological advancement. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. All right. Well, John and Jake, thank you both for your insights during the discussion portion of today's event. Let's turn to the Q&A now. Um, and before we do so, I do want to just call attention to the fact that we do have a number of insights on a lot of these topics and more, including cloud computing, artificial intelligence, semiconductors, 5G, and more on our website. So we encourage you all to take a look at the Markets and Economy blog and subscribe. And so with that, we did get a number of questions sent in ahead of time. So thank you all for doing so. We always appreciate getting pre-submitted questions first. We're going to go through a few of those during this portion as well. Um, and so with that, our first question is, thoughts on the meta universe with metaverse and how far out is that theme from being realized? Um, John, you wanna go first? Yeah, so conceptually the metaverse, I guess, kind of refers to a, a blurring of lines between the virtual world and the physical world. So, you know, things that you're doing in the physical world would you be able to do in the virtual world with pretty, uh, immersive and realistic uh, environments. So I think we'll see some of the core innovations behind this idea start to get traction. Uh, like we'll see prototyping and design software increasingly uh, incorporating real world and, and real time weather conditions. So if you're building a building, you know, uh, you know, if it rains too much, what sort of design choices you need to make to, uh, you know, maybe alter the design of the building. Um, similarly, I think we'll see more immersive video gaming, like we, we may see uh, more traction in VR type gaming. But ultimately, I think we're still pretty far away from the platonic ideal of the metaverse, where you'd be spending uh, you know, hours upon hours of time in these virtual worlds where your digital identity would uh, almost become currency and you'd be able to move it across different platforms and you know, develop skills and create virtual economies that you can monetize those virtual skills from. I think we're very far away from that, both technologically. Uh, you know, if you wear a VR headset, there's, there's still some problems where people feel nauseous if they wear it for too long. That doesn't really lend itself well to living in that sort of virtual world. Uh, and then also just culturally, there's uh, some pretty big hangups that we're going to have to get over uh, to actually realize this dream. Can I just jump in here? I, I think some of the hype around the metaverse um, falls into what we sort of call here at M&M the, the, the Colorado syndrome, right? And for anyone who's driven through the Midwest, you know, you know that you can see the Rockies from a pretty considerable distance. You know, it, it sort of looks like you're close when you first see them, right? But you're probably still in Kansas or Nebraska and you still have like several hours to go before you actually arrive. So, uh, you know, when a new technology arrives at the metaverse, uh, people see it and 
uh, they start to think it goes mainstream pretty quickly. Um, but the reality is, is that we're quite a far ways away from it being that kind of mainstream. Um, autonomous vehicles, you know, similar there, I think uh, that comes to mind. You know, Google started testing their pod car, I think like seven years ago. Tesla's maybe six years in. We still got a long, long ways to go before that becomes like a viable transportation alternative. Um, or maybe the best example that, that I can think of is, I think Bill Gates in like 2004 or five, maybe, uh, he was speaking at the World Economic Forum and he said that uh, spam would go away within two years um, after they did, Microsoft developed an anti-spam filter. Um, and I'm pretty sure of this day, the last number I saw was there's something like 50 billion spam emails sent every day. Um, so again, it's that Colorado syndrome where people think it's going to happen you know, much sooner than it actually does. And that doesn't even take into consideration the amount of spam calls and text messages I feel like I sure. get every single exactly. day. Um, Jake, back to you. This question here, or at least I think this is probably for you, is the run in large tech slash the fangs done? Jake? Who? Um, <clears throat> let me, I'm trying to think of a way to answer that without stepping over the line and uh, getting a call from compliance. Um, let, let me just say this. I think, I think it's convenient for investors to come up with sort of cute acronyms like FANG, or in China, it's the, it's the BATS, right? Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Um, and then the media and like generalists sort of treat them as one. Uh, in reality, I think there are very different companies with very different growth drivers and very different fundamentals, right? I mean, Amazon's core retail business has 3% operating margins and Facebook has what, 40, 50% margins. So just I just say upfront, different businesses, but they tend to get lumped together. Um, and frankly, I don't even, they don't even trade together. I mean, Netflix, you know, the N and the FANG um, has underperformed the S&P by something like 50% over the last four years, I think. Um, no doubt accentuated by what's happened recently, but even before that, um, it's been underperforming for a couple of years. But there is this common misconception, right? That, oh, the FANGs are taking over the world. Over the world. Um, now, what I will say is that, you know, fundamentals, you know, they went out given a long enough time horizon. Um, so maybe not speaking directly on the FANGs, but just on some of the large cap tech platforms. Uh, there are many companies that have, had, have proven to have, you know, pretty incredibly durable growth profiles. And the question we always get is, well, how much bigger can they get, right? Amazon, you know, it's already a, you know, one and a half trillion dollar market cap. How, how can it possibly get any bigger? Um, and I think that they can. I mean, Amazon's a great, great uh, one to talk about. I mean, what's really interesting to me about Amazon is that, you know, their fastest growing businesses all happen to be their highest margin businesses. So you sort of have this mix shift, right? Where Amazon used to be sort of like a product company, uh, but more recently they've crossed the chasm and now the majority of their revenues are uh, services, which is composed, composed of cloud computing, uh, the 3P marketplace business and advertising. So um, I would venture to say that they're probably not done uh, bolting on additional revenue streams. Uh, it seems like they're extremely well positioned to commercialize their logistics business as well um, and kind of compete head on with FedEx. So that's sort of one example of sort of like the mega, tech cap, mega cap tech platforms uh, which seemingly have almost limitless, you know, addressable markets. Um, and, you know, again, I won't speak to FANG as a group, but I will say that there is certainly the capacity uh, for some of these platforms to continue to gain uh, share uh, of the market index uh, or the market in general. Yeah, I think that discerning element is important and a key takeaway there. John, I got a listener writing in referencing efforts to bring chip manufacturing back to the US. What obstacles, what are the obstacles there and is that doable? Yeah, so I guess to, to give some background on, on why there are these, there's these efforts in the first place. Over the last several years, we've seen increasing trade tensions between China and the US, uh, kind of increasing aggression uh, from China towards Taiwan, which they view as their territory. And you know, on top of that, a number of pandemic and natural disaster related supply disruptions that have all kind of revealed how just how vulnerable our global tech supply chain really is. So it's driving a pretty rare bipartisan consensus uh, in the US as, as well as in Europe and Japan to bring more ma semi-manufacturing onshore. Uh, so I guess to give you an idea of the scope of the challenge that we're talking about, US companies design about half of the world's semiconductors today 
but we only manufacture about 10% of the world's semiconductors onshore. And those trends are, are getting worse. Um, if you just look at high-end, uh, you know, meeting edge Moore's Law type semiconductors, about 80% uh, are man manufactured in Asia, mostly in Taiwan, uh, and a much smaller percentage are, are manufactured in the US. So we're in a situation where we we have to import almost all the semiconductors that we're actually consuming. And, uh, you know, that's driving a lot of efforts to bring more of that onshore. So in the U.S., we've the Congress has enacted the CHIPS Act, which would provide 50 billion in manufacturing and research incentives. Importantly, they haven't actually funded the CHIPS Act. So those incentives are not in place as of yet. The funding mechanism was included in the Build Back Better bill. So that's still yet to be determined whether, uh, when or whether that will actually get funded. So 52 billion is a lot of money and it's a pretty market shift in US industrial policy. It's not nearly enough to do what politicians wanted to do, essentially. I personally think that adding a zero at the end of that number might be a reasonable starting point in terms of the incentives that we would need to offer to really fully localize our semiconductor production. So give you some context, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, which is the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer, they've guided towards spending at least 40 billion in CapEx this year on top of 30 plus years of investment they've already put in their business. They're building a $15 billion fab in the US over the next couple of years. That's maybe going to account for three or 4% of their manufacturing capacity. So 50 billion gets things moving in the right direction, but it certainly doesn't start to localize our, our semiconductor uh, production. Beyond the money, it takes time to build these fabs. It takes time to get plans approved, to physically build these facilities, to install equipment, to get the equipment working correctly such that you can you know, fully utilize it. It's on the order of like three to four years per fab. So even under a pretty aggressive timetable, you're talking about like a decade plus to build all the capacity you would potentially need. That's before you even think about finding people to work in these facilities. Wait, can I follow up on that one a little bit? Finding people to work. If we have the money, if we've got the time, are you suggesting that the people is an issue as well? Yeah, I mean, th this is skilled labor. These are, a lot of these people are engineers. Many of them have graduate degrees. Even amongst semi uh, engineers, it tends to be kind of an apprenticeship model. You have to do it for a long time to really become good at it. Um, you know, semi manufacturing is very iterative. You learn through mistakes over time. We just don't have that in the United States. Europe doesn't really have that. We don't have tens of thousands of engineers sitting around looking for work. So we don't even frankly have a robust pool of engineering students who could potentially become those engineers over time. So we're talking about a problem in terms of talent that you would really need to solve over years, decades, maybe, if at all. Okay, that's a little bit gloomy, but I appreciate the color there. Um, Jake, let me turn this next one over to you. Uh, this listener is writing and asking about opportunities in healthcare technology. Um, sure. Um, put an asterisk in my comments because our life sciences team covers healthcare tech, but I can probably speak maybe just generally about some of the things I know that they've taken a look at. Um, I know that they've spent a lot of time looking at companies that are sort of using um, artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to drive efficiencies. Um, so I think molecules, molecule simulation is one, uh, which is um, basically enables researchers to sort of, as I understand it, um, sort of predict molecule properties in the discovery stage of a drug. So they don't have to be, I guess, physically synthesized. Um, as I understand it, again, this ends up reducing sort of the discovery phase several years from like two to three years versus like four to six in a traditional uh, process. And I think it costs about half as much and the, the, the higher the likelihood that companies have as well, uh, the chance of success there. So um, that's one area. Um, biosimulation is another area um, that just, you know, this process allows you to basically predict how molecules will behave in the body. Um, and I think this enables researchers to look at more drug candidates and get a better idea of sort of like the safety and dosing profiles uh, before they run sort of expensive clinical trials. 
And then I think the last area that I've seen come out of life sciences quite a bit is um, basically looking at like um, regu regulatory submission technologies, which sort of automates the, automates the submission process, um, which as my understanding is that it's just incredibly complex and burdensome. Um, so those are the three areas uh, that I know that they've spent considerable uh, efforts looking into. And Jake, you know, thank you for reaching out and working with the team. Just for a little bit of backdrop for a second, it is a team-based process here. And we have individual experts for certain sectors and industries who can provide insight. So while the question did refer to healthcare tech, we do have additional um, expertise in the life sciences group. And oftentimes, and Jake, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys will work together in certain situations to you know, increase each other's knowledge share based on the name, the opportunity, the theme, the industry, et cetera. That's correct, yeah. Um, Jake, I do wanna send another one back your way too. What are the bullish and bearish arguments going forward in this economic environment? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think what's happening right now, you know, this is, we're in a macro pullback, right? You know, this is just a top-down market. Um, sort of the geopolitical backdrop combined with some uncertainty in the Fed's rate path. It's, it's just really choppy right now. Uh, I think yesterday, to me, felt like a major de-risking event across the board um, where there was really no place to hide. So we've sort of been in this sort of growth to value rotation for the past two-ish months. Um, but I feel like what we are increasingly starting to see is just sort of indiscriminate selling as investors look to sort of stem the bleeding and reduce exposure Likely on the view that Europe's probably going into recession um, and central banks are starting to pull in liquidity and a lot of the fiscal stimulus that's helped the market, uh, that's waning. And then obviously you have the inflation boogeyman. So risks are rising for sure. Um, it's probably prudent to ensure clients aren't taking on any unintended risks. So at this point in the cycle, you know, you want to own what we call, you know, the cement mixers and the demolition derby, right? It's those companies that have rock solid balance sheets strong underlying fundamentals uh, and capable management teams. I think the bullish argument for staying the course uh, in this type of an environment is that uh, historically they provided opportunities that will set the stage uh, for you to create, you know, a great deal of wealth for your clients, right? Um, when you have indiscriminate selling, uh, valuations sort of become divorced from fundamentals um, and you have investors that are quite literally willing to sell you a dollar or 50 cents um, because they can't stomach the short-term pain. Um, and what, what better environment can you ask for as an investor who's kind of, you know, long-term focused, right? Yep. yep. Again, uh, it's useful as well to hear your color from the bottom up and from that fundamental perspective, even on some of these bigger picture macro issues. You know, a lot of times we'll have macro analysts provide that, but, you know, Jake, I appreciate you doing so. John, um, I think we got time for one more and... Uh, I want to send this one your way. Do you have any thoughts, a little macro-ish slash, slash perhaps even investment philosophy, maybe? Do you have any thoughts on investing in a declining market? Is there anything specifically that you would share with the audience for thinking about investing when the market is experiencing losses? Yeah, um, we, we sort of touched on this earlier, but I, I think you have to know any equity investment is carries risk. Any growth investment carries probably more risk. So you need to know what your comfort level with that risk is and, and how the investments that you own correspond with your comfort level with risk. And that kind of gets into the downside analysis stuff that we were talking about. If, if you own a bunch of stocks that you think reasonably have 50% downside in a bear case, and you're not comfortable with 50% downside in your portfolio, you should probably uh, alter your the composition of your portfolio and perhaps get into names where, you know, the fundamentals are going to be steadier that trade at, you know, more appealing multiples, that, that sort of thing. But beyond that sort of thing, uh, the work is kind of the same, whether we're in an up market or a down market, our process down to the T is the exact same, whether or not the S and P 500 is up that day, that week, that month, that quarter or down. Um, you know, we've, we here at Manning have tried to find an approach to investing that works well across all environments versus kind of panicking every time the market moves in a different direction, trying to, uh, you know, alter our approach uh, with each blow of the wind. So 
if my stock is down because futures are are down on spiking oil prices, as long as my view of the company that I've invested in hasn't changed, it doesn't really change my approach to the investment at all, uh, other than you know potentially the valuation is more attractive. Yep. yep, yep. Seizing the opportunity as you see it. Well, thank you, John and Jake, for being here. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. I do want to make sure everyone knows we have included a link to a survey in the chat and would appreciate any feedback you have on today's event, the content, whether it was what you were looking for. And we, we hope the depth in um, some of these uh, conversation points were a little bit uh, deeper than normal and hopefully valuable for all of you. Um, this will come in after the Zoom session is finished. If we did not get to your question, and I know I see a few of them out there, you know, one of which even a technical question, um, yes, the data was as of the month the rate hike started. So for example, even a question like that, please feel free to send it in. We're more than happy to help. Um, and lastly, as a reminder for your convenience, a recording of this webinar will be emailed shortly after today's event. So with that, again, John and Jake, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jake. Thanks. And to our listeners, thank you for attending today's webinar.